Hello and welcome to the seventh edition of Chicago Business Podcast. I am your host, Drew Sekula, and I am very excited today to bring you this, uh, this podcast where I sat down with Lee Henderson, uh, Ernst Young's America's Growth Markets Leader and a partner in the uh, Chicago office in the audit practice. So Lee and I go way back. Uh, we started in uh, San Jose. Uh, he was a couple of years ahead of me. So I've uh, known him since 1997. And we really had a great discussion, kind of revisiting uh, some uh, some old times as well as is uh, as, as really talking about what he's up to and and what uh, what his experience has been like here in Chicago since he moved here since 2010. So uh, very excited to bring this to you. Let's go ahead and get on with the show. Today, we welcome Lee Henderson, an insurance partner in the Chicago office of Ernst & Young, where he's also the America's Growth Markets Leader. Great to have you on today, Lee. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Drew. Great to be here. Yeah. So, uh, looks like you're uh, working from home with the rest of uh, the country. <laughs> Feels like the rest of the world. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep, yep. It's uh, interesting times we find ourselves in. Yeah. Yeah, I was, crazy times, man. I was running through some notes from uh, just as I prepared for the interview, and you know, there's 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 so much to talk about, and and in fact, uh, it's not till the end. Well, we'll where we'll maybe touch on some of the COVID nineteen stuff. That's uh, not the most fun and the the most fun stuff. It seems like uh, it's so easy to get sucked into uh, those parts of the uh, that part of the discussion, but yeah. Um, but there, there's so much else going on uh, it, as well, uh, at least in, in the greater scheme of things. I know it's hard to see past what, what we have here, you know, directly in front of us and, and, and trying to figure out what those next uh, couple months uh, and, 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 and beyond that look like. But uh, in the greater s scheme of things, there still is the, the rest of the world that hopefully we'll be able to get back to here in, uh, in the not too distant future. So. I hope. I hope. Yeah. So the uh, you know Lee Lee and I for the uh, for the audience out there we uh, we have some history together. So yeah, uh, dating back some I guess yeah I was doing the math I guess twenty three years ago Decades, we met man. Uh, back there in San Jose. <laughs> That's right. That's right, man. Yeah, yeah. And you know I I'd, I'd forgotten Drew that you were from Chicago. Right. So I ended up here. You know, I think we moved. I think we moved back to Chicago or moved to Chicago the same year. I think you moved back here in 2010. That's and right. I, and I moved here from uh, for the first time, in my case, from London in 2010. So we ended up back here at the same time, man. That's funny, man. Small world. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to uh, we'll, we'll finally make some time maybe after this so we can get the families together and, sure. and, and enjoy. I know that, uh, it was funny. I was, I was, uh, looking at some of your Facebook stuff and I see our daughters are even named practically the same name. My, my are, daughter's name is Ayla and you just tacked you, on the, uh, on the front are of you serious? Here, so lots in common there. <laughs> That's funny. That's hilarious, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How old are the kids? How old are your kids now? I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Can you say that one more time, Lee? I'll say, how old are the kids now? Oh, my kids are now uh, 11. My son, uh, Chase, is 11, and my daughter is 9. So Okay. Yeah, mine are 15 and 16. Ready to get them out of the house, man. Nice. <laughs> All right. So before we get into your origin story, uh, if you could please introduce the uh, beverage of the day that we're enjoying this uh, this early evening, the B.O.D. as I like to call so, it. <laughs> so I've got a glass. I, I was thinking bourbon, but I ended up with a glass of cab um, a quilt, which is uh, one I'm trying for the well, I just tried for the first time a couple weeks ago. It's pretty good. So so cheers, buddy. Nice. Cheers. My cheers. I decided to join you as well. Of course, tried to tried to match it up. What uh, what was your uh, selection today? Which uh, which Cabernet did you go with? Quilt. It's like like the blanket. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
I never, I never heard of it until, well, I didn't, I shouldn't say I've, I'd heard of it, but I'd never had it until about two weeks ago. Okay. But, uh, it's really good, man. Right. And, and most importantly, my wife loves it. There, hey, exactly. <laughs> Without that, you, you, you don't have much. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great. Yep. I, uh, it's funny. We have a few bottles of wine, uh, yeah, around our house, but, uh, or maybe a few more than a few. We've, we've been putting a pretty good dent in the cellar with, uh, uh, lately, uh, yeah. not, not, not much of a cellar, but in the basement anyway, but, yeah, uh, yeah. but we, uh, I had to make a quick, uh, trip to the store today and I, uh, I was able to dig up a, uh, a, a bottle of, uh, of Whitehall Lane there at, uh, oh, at yeah. the, the, the current vintage. So that was the, the first case of wine I ever, I ever bought some 20 years ago. And no, it was more than about 25 years ago. Um, was a case of Whitehall Lane, so I decided to uh, yeah bring up a blast from the past. And it's, yeah, uh, yeah, that's cool, man. How was it? It's good. It's good. Yeah. I got it right here. I mean, I oh, that's what you got there. Okay. Too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Figured why good, not. Good. Good. So, well, that's great. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump into probably your uh, your origin story. Maybe if you could share some of your background and kind of. Uh, uh, you know, we touched on your title. We'll talk more about your current role uh, in a little bit. But uh, if you could tell us kind of, um, yeah, what it was like, uh, where you came from, and what it was like yeah. growing up. Yeah, well, well, you want me to go way back? I mean, if yeah, I, I start at the if, beginning. If, we got, if we I got give some you time. The, if I give you the quick story from way back, so born in, you know, born in London, right, which you, you, may, you may or may not remember that, Drew, I, but no, born in London, I, um, left London when I was two not by myself, of course, um, went to Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica, where I was then, um, lived until I was 13, and then hopped on a plane that, that summer, I think summer of eight, that would have made summer of, what, 84 or something like that, hopped on a plane to California, and, um, and that's where it all started. I mean, that's where it all started in the U.S., so went to school, went to school here um, in, in the U.S., uh, in, went to school in Oakland, California, Skyline High School, so representing the Titans, um, and then left there, went to Washington, D.C. to go to Howard University, lasted there about two years, transferred back to um, California where I went to Cal State Hayward, now Cal State East Bay, you remember it as Hayward. Um, started with the firm in 95, which is then, you know, you and I met a year later, maybe two years later, I think two yeah. years later. Um, now I spent mo a lot of my time in San Jose, but, um, did it, did it, did some time, did a year in New York after being in California for almost a de little over a decade, did a year in New York, um, uh, three, four years, almost four years in London and then moved to uh, Chicago. And so Chicago's been home for the last, um, or live in the suburbs of Chicago, that's been home for the last 10 years, man. And, and just, it's insane, because it just seems like time, I mean, it's like, where's time gone, man? You know, so, so yeah, so 20, almost 25 years with the firm now. 25 years, man. It doesn't feel like that long, which I guess is a good thing, but, um, but it's been a while. Yeah, well, you know, no gray hairs to show of it. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah. you look good. You look <laughs> yeah, young. Thanks, and, man. Uh, so uh, no, it's funny how uh, how time can, can can fly so fast, and especially with the with the little ones or not not so little ones anymore, right? They just yeah. sprout up, yeah. and yours are yours are practically out of the house. Yeah, I've got a junior now. Um, you know, junior. You know, looking at schools, looking at colleges, doing you know, testing and, um, and then, and, and a freshman. So, so yeah, it's about, it's, it's, it's about to get real, I guess. Right. <laughs> with, with, that, with that whole situation. Yeah. So, um, no, man, I don't, I don't feel too old until I start doing the math and then I'm like, damn, I've got a kid that's going to go to college soon and, uh, and been with the firm as long as I've been. So, you know, so it's been, you know, been married. My wife reminded me that, uh, next year she's like, well, what's big about next year? I'm like, um, I don't know. It's going to be 2021. She's like, what does that mean? I was like, oh, wait a minute. Married for 20 years next year. So, so yeah, so no, time flies, man, but it's, but it's good. It's good. Nice. You know, every, everything, everything is good with all that's going on. Drew, I got to say, man, I'm, I'm, I'm we're, we're fortunate and blessed, you know, for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, anybody who is, uh, at least 
uh, healthy and at home is uh, in pretty good shape relative to where we all could be. So That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's amazing how these kind of things, crisis put things in perspective, right? You're like, ah, you know what? You know, it's not that bad, you know, when, when you know, t- to some extent, you know, you evaluate things differently. Like you said, it's just like, you know, you talk to people now, you're like, how you doing? Are you healthy? Your family healthy? Yep. Okay. All right. Pretty good. Right. So, right. That's a ni- nice foundation to build off of. So that's great. Um, so yeah, maybe if you could spend a couple minutes talking about your current, uh, your current role uh, with, with EY and, and, uh, and what you're doing here in Chicago. Yeah, so, you know, so Drew, you remember, I mean, I, I started with the firm in the audit practice, and I'm still, that's been pretty consistent with the exception of a couple of years while I was in London. Uh, so I'm, I'm still an audit partner, right? I've got clients in the audit practice, and I serve companies from large public companies to, you know, private equity-backed companies, pre-IPO, um, done several IPOs and public o- other public offerings and so on. Um, so that, that's sort of my trade, if you will. But I also, as you mentioned, I'm the America's growth markets leader. So growth markets, what we call kind of internal to the firm, think about it as an outside standpoint as middle market, right? So um, I run part of our middle market practice uh, for the Americas. And the Americas for us is North America, you know, North, South, Central America, U.S. and Canada. Um, well, I guess that's, that's North America. Um, yeah, U.S., Canada, and uh, South and Central America is the America. So I'm responsible for just making sure that those accounts are served properly. We, uh, we identify the right, um, you know, the right accounts that, uh, that we want to work with. Um, and and one, of the, one of the most fun part of it, Drew, to be honest with you, is, is I get a chance to also, within that, is our Entrepreneur of the Year program. So we've got an Entrepreneur of the Year program that we've been doing, dealing with, that we've had for over three decades now. And, um, and, and I'm responsible for that. So I get a chance to really spend a ton of time with a lot of entrepreneurs, high growth companies and so on. So that's, that's a, all my job is fun, but that's a really fun um, part of what I do today. That's great. That's great. I, I, uh, I had seen that and, and had a little bit of exposure to that previously. I would think that that would be, uh, yeah. yeah, a great spot for, uh, to, to explore some of those entrepreneurial, uh, you know, uh, interests that you could have still within the, uh, the, the large firm feel, right. And really getting mm-hmm. close to, to fast growing businesses. I, that's right. Um, that's right. No, it's a lot of fun, man. And, uh, and then to have a, a national leader role like that here in Chicago is, um, are there no? Are there quite a few national leaders that are based here in Chicago, or there's, there's, that, there's, uh, there's a there's a few. You tend to be like uh, we've got national leaders all over the place. Technically, you all kind of you all kind of end up meeting up in New York, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like the center of our kind of national universe, if you will. But um, obviously, now we're getting a little bit more creative, right, with how we meet up, <laughs> like That's we're doing sure. now. So, so before, you know, I've been doing it now for about this role for about a year. Before that, I was a reach. I had the same role, but in the region, the central region, which is kind of where we're sitting right now. So, you know, so I go back, I travel a bit around the uh, around the area and um, and back and forth in New York a lot until until this all happened. But no, man, it's it's amazing how quickly we're able to kind of sort of pivot and and adapt to different ways and and uh haven't really lost a ton to be honest in terms of just how we're connecting i mean look how you and i connecting right now i mean you know it'd be good to it'd be good to kind of you know give you a handshake and a hug but um but you know for now this is not bad right no it's not and in fact it's you know quite a bit easy quite a bit easier when you don't have to coordinate you know four hours of travel schedule <laughs> right. between you know meeting downtown and and the rest of it. So that's in some, right. way, some ways it can be, uh, it can reduce some, a lot of those barriers as well. That's right. So that's right. Yeah. That, that's great. So yeah, let's maybe uh, t- touch a little bit about on uh, uh, what brought you to Chicago. If I remember, I thought it was, might've been what the, the Groupon pursuit way back in the day or. No, it wasn't. Um, it actually wasn't Groupon. It, 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 so we, it was, um, so no, I wasn't on the Groupon uh, oh. piece. I came, I came to Chicago, actually, it came on and served Aon. Um, I was oh. one of the partners on the, on the Aon account um, okay. for a few years. So yeah, so it was, you know, it's interesting how it happens. Talk about adaptability, man. I was on my way back to really San Jose, and then I got a call um, saying, hey, look, you know what, how'd you, how'd you like to um, 
go to, go to Chicago. Came to Chicago, met a handful of um, the partners here, and and I always joke and say it was May, the month of May when I came <laughs> to Chicago. Right now, I kind of knew Chicago, but it was May. May was, you know Chicago in May, Drew? It's beautiful. Right, there's no better place, man. Everyone's <laughs> out. There's concerts everywhere, street festivals, and so I'm like, sign me up, you know. <laughs> and then that first winter hit. The first winter I was here was that was like Snow Mageddon. If you remember Snow, yeah, because you came here around yeah. back around the same time. Was that the Snow Mageddon yeah. year? And I was like, holy cow, what the heck is this? So, um, so yeah, so I'm, you know, I don't know if you ever get used to it, but you know, it's home. It's home. Yeah. Now. Well. So. <laughs> yeah, not 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 quite uh, Jamaica or California. Right, that's right, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah man. Get... The sun, like the sun and the heat, became a thing of the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then of course, yeah. And then this May is just you know turned into nothing but rain and. Uh, right. Yeah, but we'll it... see, man. Those golf courses will be open at some point. Yeah, yeah. So. So then, uh, yeah, I guess you got settled here. And so what's kept you here? You know, you had moved around a fair amount and uh, you decide, decided to stay, huh? You, you, you liked what you found, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, Chicago's a, uh, you know, it's a great city, man. You know, a, a friend of ours um, who are now really good friends, they were in London at the same time we were. And, um, and, I said, and, I, and, I, and I said, you know, I said, if it wasn't, I remember the, saying at one point, I said, you guys should move to Chicago before we were planning on moving here. And I said to him, I said, man, it's too cold in Chicago. You know, I said, if it wasn't so cold in Chicago, I would be there. And I remember him saying, he said, man, if it wasn't, if it wasn't so cold in Chicago, everyone would live there. And, um, and there's some truth to that, man. I mean, this is, I mean, Drew, you know, you grew up here. This is a great city. I mean, it's a great city. Um, there's a lot of culture. There's a lot of diversity. Uh, there's so many businesses that are based here that, that, that makes it great. And, you know, I was joking about coming in May. Um, I mean, you know, this place when the weather is nice, I mean, everyone's out, man. It's, you've got the restaurants, you've got festivals, you've got concerts brought, you know, sort of their, their Broadway, you know, shows and, and so on. So that's what kept me here from a personal standpoint, as well as, you know, my kids got to the point where, um, it's sort of because of all the moves, this is like the place that they've sort of lived the longest and, you know, going through like middle school and high school, you're like, okay, well, let's just leave them alone. Everything is working out. It's all good. Let's just leave it as it is. And from a business standpoint, you know, the, um, all right, we've got a great office here in Chicago, right? Great people. So that's, you know, my clients and stuff has kept me here too. And, you know, I've got been able to work with some, just some, some fantastic companies and, um, and executives and also just organizations that I've gotten connected to outside of the firm has really kind of grounded me and kept me here as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's great to hear. I know that, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, people have a, you know, the grass can seem greener at, uh, on the other side, you know, but yeah. uh, we have a lot to be thankful for here. Um, I'm interested in you sharing a little bit more of your perspective after having spent, you know, a decade there in, in Silicon Valley and, and really the boom, boom years, or I guess there's, you know, there's been lots of boom and bust years uh, in that 95, 2000, uh, um, 2005 uh, area. How would you compare? And well, and also given your, your current role, you know, leading up the, uh, the uh, growth markets uh, for EY, how would you kind of compare and contrast the the culture of innovation and uh, entrepreneurship in the in Silicon Valley versus what we have here in Chicago? You know, it's, it's a great question, Drew. I mean, the, the way I would look at it, I would say there's there's an incredible amount of innovation and like just brain power here. I mean, to be honest with you, you look. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the technology in the valley, sort of some of it was born um, here. Or those those folks true. I mean, you go all the way back, and a lot of your listeners, younger listeners, don't remember even like Netscape. But you you look at even Netscape, which you and I kind of grew up on back in the days. That was, um, you know, the founder of Netscape came from University of Illinois, your alma mater, right? So there's so much um, innovation and brain and tech here. But you know, the Valley, back when we were there, that was the place, right? So if you wanted to be tech and innovative and cool it was sort of, you were sort of like, well, that's where you got to go to be. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You need to go there and, and do it. And as a result, 
there so much money was settled in the valley. So it got to the point where, well, if you want to get investment, which you need investment to grow, you need to go there because there's so much money to go around. I think if you look at um, is Chicago and, and the Midwest in general, what it's done, it's, it's starting to find innovative ways to, to keep people here. And as a result, you're starting to see a lot more entrepreneurs staying here. You're starting to see a lot more innovation. And that's a result of some of the, um, the VC funds. One is there's a lot more VC funds that are now have been born in Chicago. But also, I think a lot of the coast are starting to recognize that there is an incredible amount of talent um, in, in the Midwest and in Chicago and is starting to bring their money here a little bit more. So I think, you know, we're, we're still, it's still not, it's still not that, that same um, cash flowing around every company that has an idea like we saw in the Valley, Drew. But I would say certainly from when I got here in 2010 to now and what you see in terms of innovation and technology companies staying in Chicago, I think it's, 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 it's been significantly improved. And we've had some great su success stories, right? You look at people like Brad Keywell, right? Um, Brad Keywell, he stayed here. He made a lot of money here. He's made a lot of investment here. And, um, and so you start to see people like that hang around. You look at organizations like 1871, you know, the, the sort of technology innovation center, which I was on the board of, you know, for a while. And those kind of companies are now telling people in Chicago, hey, look, if you graduate from a school around here, if you're from here, you want to come back home, there is a place here for you to have an ecosystem of entrepreneurs and innovation that you can actually grow your company and get investment here. So I think that confidence is, has grown quite a bit. Um, even in the years that I've been here. Yeah, that's, uh, those are some great uh, uh, trends and, and things uh, happening here uh, in the city. And it's great to hear that there is some of that, uh, you know, with so much of the money being out on the coast, um, that it's getting more of the attention and, 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 uh, and that the trend is really working in our direct in, in our favor there, you know, you hear so much about businesses moving, moving out of Illinois and that risk. Right. But um, yeah, maybe can you share a little bit of your perspective there? Is are those really you know different types of business business owners than than the more innovative companies or yeah, that are what, moving out that are moving yeah, out? What, well, yeah, what's I mean I mean we have we have both we 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 have an attraction to, to the city center and to kind of the. Um, you know, all that Chicago has to offer, but then you also hear a lot of talk about the mass exodus from the state of Illinois. So how do you kind of balance yeah, the two? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I mean, you know, Chicago, you know, I, I don't know the, the, the fact, I'm not stating a fact here, but just in terms of what you hear, right, and the perception is, you know, Chicago's had its challenges. You know, you hear, when you hear Chicago, sometimes you hear of, you know, fiscal issues and so on that, um, that, that creates a, an export of people, not necessarily businesses, but people, right? So when you think about businesses, um, you think about, like, if you're starting a business, you think about talent. What's my talent pool? And if your talent pool is shrinking and they're moving away, then you say, okay, well, I need to go somewhere else for that innovative talent. So I think, I think when you hear of export, companies are moving for that reason, or they're moving because again, of capital, right? Or they're moving for an ecosystem. And again, look, it's gonna be a while before Chicago can really compute, compete with some of the ecosystem, like the tech ecosystem of the Valley. So if you're in tech and you're in the Midwest, I mean, let's be honest, or in Chicago, let's be honest, you're still not in the massive ecosystem of like the, uh, of the Bay Area, you're not, right? So you gotta kind of think in terms of a, more of a pioneer mode. Um, if you're in, 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 in um, biotech, you know, you're not going to compete with the ecosystem up in the Northeast, um, the Northeast corridor and Boston and stuff like that. But hey, you're going to be kind of a pioneer. So I think some of the export is caused by still kind of the sexiness of going to the Valley if you're a tech company or going to Boston if you're a biotech company. And I think some of it is also some of the perception of some of the fiscal challenges that uh, that Chicago has faced in the past, where companies say, "Ah, you know what? I don't even want to deal and in, in, in meddle in that. So let me just go somewhere else that's more um, that's more safe from an economic standpoint." So I think some of that's what's causing it. But again, I, I still feel that um, companies are starting to become more attracted um, to Chicago, and mainly because there's an incredible amount of talent here. The talent pool is interesting. But you know what, Drew? And I know you didn't ask this question, but it made, made me think of something else. 
I think as it relates to the times that we're going through right now, you're starting to see this shift where I feel like one of the trends that we're going to see going forward is this move to sort of the rise of small cities, right? And different cities, because mm -hmm. now that everyone is, you know, we got companies now saying that, look, you know what, this work from home thing is kind of cool. 50% of our workforce forever, you guys are going to work from home. So if you're given a choice, Drew, to work from home, I mean, people make um, living choices, you know, based on, you know, uh, um, um, you know, quality of life, cost, and so on, right? And we've already seen people leaving big cities from the east and the west coast to smaller cities anyway. So what's gonna happen when, when someone says, hey, Drew, you know what? Go and work wherever you wanna work, right? We're set up for this. I think you're gonna see a lot more people moving. Um, and I think you're gonna see a lot more companies moving to wherever they wanna move to because they don't have to be centered, right? Be right in the center of where all the talent um, is coming from. Yeah, I, you know, I totally agree with you. We've actually, uh, for our family, we've considered moving, you know, a couple times in the not too uh, distant past here, uh, including taking a very serious look at the at the Raleigh uh, area. And I was pretty shocked, you know, you you hear a lot about uh, cost of living being very good there, and and yeah. and schools and the rest of it. But you know, I spent you know weeks there, uh, taking a very close look, evaluating the uh, the wow. landscape there. And, uh, and we couldn't get the same home for, for the money there with the same, with the same level of schools. It, 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 it wasn't really even close. If, okay. if we could have, if we could have picked up our home and dropped it into a lot there and, and called it square, it would have been like <laughs> the find of a, the, the find of the decade. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I was really surprised at that. Wow. And, wow. And, that surprises me too. Yeah, but uh, but I think it's it's the same for a lot of places. I think that uh, this area really does uh, offer offer very good value is what it comes down to. And yeah, obviously, yeah, no, it's true. Obviously, property taxes are high here, right? And we don't know what this uh, progressive income tax is going to look look like, right? It's right. Passes, <laughs> but 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 still, all in, all in all, it's uh, it's a great place to be. So. Um, I guess uh, I would like to touch on another, uh, you know, an, another one of the things that people think about here uh, in Chicago and you being a, a man of the world and so much global uh, experience. I'm, I'm, you know, I know I didn't prep you for this question, but I'm going to hit you with it anyway. Um, you know, Chicago has a long history of being a melting pot for race relations, while some neighborhoods continue to experience a horrendous level of uh, violent crime. I'm uh, interested in your perspective on race relations in and around the city. Well, you know, um, it's interesting because I think that um, every, everywhere you go, most places you go in big cities, there's a level of segregation, right? And segregation is, you know, been his historically kind of drew, it, it's a, a bad word, right? But, you know, every, there's segregation everywhere. And some of that segregation is stated for the good, which is, you know, here you've got different communities. In New York, you've got different communities. And it's not necessarily for purposes of excluding everyone. It's actually for the purposes of sort of creating a community around people of common interests. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with that, but that's, that's the case. You know, when I look at Chicago, I think there's a couple layers of, of when you think about race relations. I think number one is, um, I talk about the business aspect of it, right? So the business aspect of it, and I think outside, beyond, um, beyond what we think about, um, um, uh, beyond Chicago, you've got a business issue right now. And I think um, uh, this pandemic is really causing us to see some of the inequality that exists, some of the inequality that exists in health, some of the inequalities that exist in jobs, some of the inequalities that exist in neighborhoods, right? So, and that's, that's manifesting this way throughout this pandemic right now, all the way from minority businesses not getting an equal share or consideration for, um, for funds from the pay Paycheck Protection Program just because they don't have typically traditional ways of getting funding, all the way down to the, you're now looking at um, people talking about, well, if people are going to work from home, there's a, um, a lot of minorities who are you know, frontline workers, service workers, essential workers, which those jobs are not necessarily um, stay at home jobs. So there's, does that create another level of inequality? As you get down to specifically your question in terms of the neighborhoods, yeah, I think, you know, some of the, some of the disappointment I've had in, in Chicago is where you kind of create these, um, 
these neighborhoods. And I don't live, you know, in, um, in certain areas of the city that, that, that you consider sort of high crime areas. But, you know, I take my kids, you know, through those neighborhoods and stuff sometimes just to help them understand sort of the, the, the balance and how the world works and the city works. And it's disappointing because I think that when you take a situation, Drew, and you take any situation and you say, we're going to take a, 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 a handful of people that are low income, we're going to put them in a certain area, we're going to put them all in this really condensed, um, condensed area, and then we're not necessarily going to give them the resource such as businesses, stores, which results in jobs, the, um, you know, the right types of food, uh, parks, and so on. You're going you're gonna to create this, this, this challenge that we have as a city. I mean, look, if you drive through some of the south side of Chicago, you look at the parks, you know, the parks have cracked pavement, the basketball rims are hanging, um, there's no stores. I mean, you don't see the, the, the major um, store chain. So what does that mean? Um, you don't see the health food store. And also that's job creation. So you don't get the jobs. So I think that is part of the issue of the city. I think what we've got to be thinking about to sort of improve this challenge that we have in terms of the race relation is make some conscious investments and intentional investments into some of those neighborhoods because these neighborhoods that have high crime and stuff, it's not bad people that live in the neighborhoods. It's just a lack of opportunity that sometimes that those that that don't exist um, in those areas, which then sort of manifests itself into what we see in the news and in the media. So I can go on and on on this. Topic. I'm pausing, Drew, because I don't want to go on for too long. But I can go on and on on this topic for a while, man, because it's something that I, I pay close attention to. I, I'm, you know, I'll tell you, I'm a part. I'm on the board of an organization called Big Shoulders um, Fund. Um, Great, fantastic organization. I've been there on the board my the entire time I've been in Chicago. And it is a, it, basically, it's an organization that, that funds and manages a bunch of uh, uh, Catholic schools in inner city, um, area, in, in the inner cities of Chicago. So I get an opportunity to go in these schools and speak to these students. And I'm telling you, when you, th when you hear from these students in terms of what they have to deal with, right, and you compare, Drew, to like what your kids and my kids deal with, Oh my gosh, man, you're like, how do you ever make it out of this, right? So I think that is, we've got to make sure that we are investing in those communities. And that investment is not just in terms of just dollars and mo throwing money at it. That investment in terms of like us going into those neighborhoods and, and helping those kids, the younger ones, understand what life is like outside of that neighborhood because some haven't been outside of those neighborhoods right so when you do you know you, you, you have to break the cycle i feel like you've got to break the cycle so um that's my thought on 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 that topic yeah no i i greatly appreciate your perspective and i think it makes a lot of sense and you know that there's been uh you know some progress made but uh you know as the city looks to you know redevelop in different areas there's um you know, uh, the different um, incentives that are available out there, we need to continue to push to, to try to break that cycle and, yeah, and let the let the kids see the opportunity outside, because it really starts with them, right? And a lot of that violence is, I mean, it's at the it's with the younger generation, it's because That's they right. don't see they don't see the way out. And exactly, and there's a lot of positive uh, opportunities out there as well. So we just For sure make them more available. So no, that's great. I and I was going to ask you about uh, your involvement in the uh, on the board of Big Shoulders because I had, I was not familiar with that uh, organization. Um, maybe if you could uh, share a little bit more about uh, about your experience there at 1871 and the Economic Club of Chicago as well. Yeah, well, um, it, it's interesting. It's kind of two very different, but at the same time connecting organization, you know, um, when I was on the board of 1871, you know, 1871 is a, is, is an outstanding, outstanding place for innovation and an entrepreneurship, right? They basically are helping. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a place you go to as an entrepreneur um, for space, for content, for training, um, to be a part of an ecosystem uh, share your ideas, work on your ideas, collaborate. And it's a fantastic board in terms of, uh, and it's won a number of awards globally as well for just a, a, a wonderful in a place of innovation. And, and really, I view 1871 as one of the missions, um, organizations of making sure that we harness 
um, uh, the entrepreneurship spirit and innovation and, and keep it in the city. I think it's a place where, you keep, where it's a mission of keeping that um, here uh, in the city and in the state of Illinois. Um, with the Economic Club, the Economic Club is, is fantastic. The Economic Club to me is, is I, I learned an incredible amount from the Economic Club because you get a chance to really uh, bump into some pretty influential folks you know, around the city. The Economic Club, most of the people that are part of the club have, um, have, uh, have, have done a lot and wonderful things in their career. So they'll have a lot to offer. So you go to those events and, and it's all about the networking with the folks. Great presentations and events as well. Um, but I view the value of, of the Economic Club really as a place to convene people to really learn, uh, build business relationships, but also I've built some fantastic personal relationships out of, it, out, out of uh, the Economic Club as well. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, uh, you know, uh, yeah, to, to my detriment, I think, have not gotten as involved in, in some of those uh, different, uh, uh, those different groups that are out there. I, I guess I've picked a, cup, a couple and gone with them, but I, I, uh, I should get more involved in, in, in uh, those are important networking opportunities that, uh, that I think would be helpful for, uh, for many people, including myself, so. Well, when we get back to being able to, to go somewhere with more than 10 people, uh, Drew, I'll, 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 uh, I'll drag you to one of the economic club um, events, man. You'll, I, you'll have fun. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. I'd, I'd appreciate that. So nice. Well, we're having a great discussion here, Lee. I really, really appreciate it. Maybe if you could share a little bit about some of uh, the, the top influencers that you've had kind of through, through your career. You know that, uh, you know, you've obviously – you know, cleared quite a path just yourself. And I think that you, uh, I, I know that you've had an impact on, on myself and many others. Um, but if you could talk about some of the people that have had a big impact on, uh, on your career and, and your life experiences, I'd appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I'd say Drew, I mean, I've had, uh, you know, I, I've, I have a, a quote that I, that I live by every day. It's a Jackie Robinson quote. And Jackie Robinson once said, the life is not important except for the impact it has on other lives, right? So if you think about that, that thing, a life is not important except for the impact it has on other lives. I think that there's a lot of people who, whether or not they woke up with this quote every day, um, did that for me. I mean, I go all the way back from, you know, my grandmother who, my, um, my paternal grandmother who was probably one of the most, um, influential uh uh person um to me is is a woman who did not have an opportunity for higher education but still was an entrepreneur hardworking, um charismatic and successful you know without having in not just having the benefits but having a lot of a lot of disadvantages that were caused by growing up in her time and, and she was an incredible incredible influence on me in terms of just you know, building, you know, work ethic, confidence in certain things, you know, and then of course, there's a lot of other family members, you know, including, you know, my, my dad, but you know, along the way in the firm, I had some great mentors, right. And I had people and the thing I'll, I'll uh, you know, all the way from, you know, Diane, you know, Diane Glenn, if you remember Drew back in the days, she was one of my first mentors in the firm. Um, people like most recently, John Ferraro, um, who was the person that um, sort of um, brought me to London, if you will. And then a lot of folks in between that, but the thing that really connected some of my best mentors were people that, um, that just kept it, just kept it real with me. People that pulled me to the side and say, Hey Lee, you know what? Um, we think you have some potential, but, um, but, but here's some things that you need to fix, right? Here's some things that you're not doing that great. Um, but they set it with a level, they built a level of trust with me to where you listened and you know it was coming from a right place. So, so I think I, I just had, you know, some really, really good mentors along the way that just put me in positions to where they knew I would be successful. They felt confident I would be successful and I had no idea I would be successful, but they put me there and kind of forced me to really just be outside of the box, outside of my comfort zone um, and grow. And I think that's the most incredible mentor um, one, one can have. I think, it's a, I think there's a lot of folks that you want to, that want to hear that what they're doing well. And, and I just think that that is a quality. That's, that's something that your mentor should remind you of also. But equally, I think the right mentor is one that 
much with that once that you can figure out that they want you to be successful and they really want you to be successful. And as a result, they're going to look at you and tell you, hey, you know what? You've got to do this. You've got to fix that, right? You've got to stop doing this. Um, you got to do this instead um, and, and go do it. Trust you, pay attention to this. So um, that, that's how I describe. I mean, I've got Diane Glenn, you know, Steve Almassi, Sam Johnson, you know, John Farrell, Malcolm Coley, the list goes on. I've got a lot of people that's really touched, um, touched me in, um, in, um, in, a, in a very powerful way, um, Drew. It's been, and, and I can't, I would not, I would absolutely not be where I am right now um, if it wasn't for those folks, because you, know, you, you can't go this journey alone, man. You just, you just can't. You got you to be, you gotta be able to be humble, um, listen, and surround yourself with the right people um, that are going to you know, check you and put you in your place when you need to be. Yep. No, that's, uh, that, that's great to hear. And, and definitely a big benefit of uh, working for a firm like uh, Ernst & Young. That's something that I, I know that uh, working in industry and and in uh, some different cultures, you know, you don't necessarily, you don't really get that same level of constructive criticism all the time. Yeah. Um, because people are, you know, it's just, it's just a different environment and a different culture. So I, I know that that can really be beneficial. And I, you know, I, I benefited from it my, myself in the past. And I know that's something that, uh, you know, being more of an entrepreneur myself, you know, it's, 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 takes extra work to to really get oh, yeah. some of that constructive criticism because you know it's the the rela relationships are different and you don't yeah uh, yeah for sure for sure all right so with that uh we'd be remiss not to not to talk a little bit more about the uh, the pandemic in itself so really interested in hearing kind of the the ey perspective in terms of you know on on how uh you know how the how EY has responded. And I guess, you know, that, there's a lot of commonalities in terms of, um, in, in terms of video conferencing and working remotely and those types of things. But yeah, what are some of the other things that, uh, that EY has had to put in place? I mean, obviously the impact on clients, this is like a black swan event, right? There is That's a right. black swan event. So mm -hmm. um, interested in your perspective on, on that as well. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, I'll, I'll share a couple of aspects of, of, of how um, respond to uh, the question. The question you're asking is, first of all, from our perspective, you know, we've got a, 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 a fantastic, you know, CEO of our America's, the America's practice, Kelly Greer. And, and Kelly, I mentioned Kelly specifically, not just because she's our uh, chair, you know, chair of the Americas but also because she was once an, the office managing partner of the Chicago office, right? So she still is, is kind of based here, I guess, you know, she still has a home here. And, and I tell you that, you know, people say, you know, the most important thing when you manage through crisis is to establish trust. And part of that establishing trust, you know, Drew, is, is, is sharing the reality, but providing hope, right? Is, is how do you share the reality of what's happening and the challenges in front of us, but at the same time provide hope that, that, that things are going to be, um, that things are going to be fine. And here's the reason why. And I think she's done that, but more specifically in terms of what we're doing is one thing that Ch Kelly has been very focused on, um, you know, across the Americas is it's about our people. Like, look, everything, every decision, everything we talked about has been centered coming back to the health and the wellness of our people, the care of our people. What are they doing? How do we protect them? Um, how do we give them the opportunities in this time? How do we flex and create a better work at home environment for people such as providing different benefits to purchase things, to set up your office properly at home and all those things. So it is always come back to our people. And yeah, we talk about our clients. We talk about making sure that uh, we're growing our revenue, um, limiting losses, expenses. We talk about all the stuff that everyone is talking about as well but we talk the most about how we take care of our people. And as a result, I think we're getting the return because our people feel the investment that we're making and say, you know what, if, if we're making that kind of investment at a time like this in crisis, and I'm hearing from all my friends from the different companies that are doing different things, then I need to double down and really, really show my loyalty to the firm. And I think it's, 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 it's creating a great um, um, 
payback to us. The other thing is from a family standpoint, in terms of what we're doing is, you know, we're helping our clients, right? We're sharing, you know, everyone is sort of in a state of confusion. So we're, we're spending a lot of time thinking about solutions, you know, for our clients, bringing things to um, companies. And one of the things I think is really cool that we have done, Drew, is not think about revenue for a period of time of, of revenue growth um, in this aspect and said, what are the businesses that are really struggling the most and don't typically have access to us? These small companies, small and mid-sized companies um, that don't always have access to us and how do we provide help to them? So we've had like this thought leadership series of like webinars and thought leadership that we created specifically like around things like PPP, cash flow forecasting, how do you do it, that we were focused on with chambers of commerces, um, small business organizations. And Drew, we've done these webinars. We've had, a web, we've had webinars with thousands of companies, thousands of people that's just desperate for this information. So I think we spent a lot of time because people forget, Drew, I think sometimes people look at entrepreneurs and say, okay, small businesses, oh, whatever. It's a little bunch of you know, corner restaurants and stuff. But what we found as we dug into this is we've had a lot of, of our big clients coming to us and said, hey, can you help us with that small business stuff? Because we've got a bunch of customers that need that information because we sell to small businesses or we've got a bunch of vendors that are in our supply chains who are those small businesses who needs help so people forget sometimes that we think of small businesses as these little businesses no they're the ones that are the customers that are then selling into the consumer challenge for the big companies and those are the ones that are supplying the big blue chip companies that that we that we that we found and look they employ 50 percent you know entrepreneurs like like you drew you guys employ 50 percent of the u.s workforce man so this is an area that we've made a conscious effort to really really hone in our focus on and just say look let's do the right thing to help these companies right now and that's all we're thinking about in this aspect of the market yeah that's great that's great to see uh you know such a you know such a huge company you know being a big four firm and and as focused as you have to be on fortune 500 and 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 the top echelon of 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 companies to make that investment in the in the little guys too is something that uh yeah is truly impactful and i know uh well appreciated so that's that's great to hear uh indeed so all right well um i appreciate your time you know i'm I uh, I would like to hear a little bit about, so what's kind of the next step for you? I guess you're only a year uh, into this role, so you have some runway there, but what are you thinking over, uh, you know, as you approach the future and, and, and what that looks like for you? Yeah, well, you know, um, you know my, my, my dad always told me, um, you know, Drew, I remember he gave me um, a piece of advice one time and he said, hey, look, Lee, he said, what you've got to do is always remember to work your tail off and be really focused on what you've been asked to focus on, but at the same time, be a student. And he was very specific on that, be a student of the next, of the next thing, right? And his point was that, that oftentimes we get so caught up in terms of like, okay, what's the next thing we get? We keep our eyes off the ball on sort of what's next, right? As opposed to just really being focused on, look, my job is to really execute really well on what I'm being asked to do. And then opportunities will arise, but I'm also keeping my ears open and stuff in terms of, okay, understanding the way everything else works and how what I'm doing fits into that. So, you know, um, longer answer to your question of what you're asking, but I think in terms of me is look, this is an interesting time right now and we're, we're in a little bit of crisis and hopefully we're coming out of it, you know, soon. Some feel we're going to come out of it next quarter. Some feel we're going to come out of it in 2021. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, I'm not going to try to predict the weather on that one. Um, but, but I'll tell you is, is I'm really now focused on is how do we continue to serve our companies? We're, we're a service, we're a service um, provider, we're a service firm. And what I want to do right now is all my focus is on how do we service those that are in the greatest need, right? And I talk about from how do I use my platform to serve our community, right, through the organization I'm a part of? How do I use my role in the firm to, uh, to service our people, our younger people, and give them the opportunities? 
how do I use my, my, my role and my, my specialty in the firm to service my clients and bring the best thing to my clients? And ultimately, you know, how do I, um, uh, you know, fulfill my fiduciary duty as a partner and help to grow the firm as well? And that's really what I'm focused on, uh, Andrew. And it comes in the form of the role that I've been given right now, which is to grow our middle market practice. But, you know, that's eventually going to morph into something. But for now, you know, it, it's like, man, we're we're in the cloud, man. On this thing right now, we're like in the mud. We're in the trenches, man. I can't even I can't even see like above the trench right now. I'm like, I mean, we're in there. So you know, it's gonna take a while for me to kind of work through this stuff. You know, work through this time frame that we have in terms of what's going on with this pandemic. And ultimately, Drew, I feel good based on the firm that I'm with, the history I've had, the mentors I've had, that I will have the right opportunity when it's the right time. Right. And I feel and I rest comfortably in that. And that's what enables me to really focus on what's in front of me. Yeah, that's great to hear. And, yeah, you know, I, I could tell back in uh, 1997 that you were, uh, you know, there was a, a shining star there. And it's great to see, you know, all the progress you've made so far. And there's no doubt that your best years are ahead of you. So, no, no, um, thanks, Drew. Thanks, Drew. But hey, Drew, but I got to give it up to you, too, man. I tell you. Like I have a different level of appreciation for the the entrepreneur, right? And I mean, and you know, you 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 know, you were um, a corporate guy for a long time, and to step out and take the risk that you have in terms of being an entrepreneur and being a job creator, right? You're now a job creator, man, and you've got this platform to create jobs, um, impact you know, people around you impact, impact our economy directly with your hands um, is, is incredible. And, and, you know, meeting entrepreneurs and hearing the stories and hearing the grind of what they've got to go through and how, you know, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur as well, as I mentioned, my grandmother also. So I have a tremendous amount of respect, man, for, um, for just you and, and, and the type of person that you are to do what you do and be good at it, smile every day, um, provide for your family and um and create jobs so i'm proud of you man Seriously, on a personal level i'm really proud of you and and um and i've got an incredible amount of admiration for uh um, for you and what you're doing well thank you very much i appreciate it, lee and with that we'll go ahead and wrap up so uh again thanks lee for uh for joining us and uh and i look forward to continuing the discussion yeah great great reunion man thanks for having me drew appreciate yeah, it brother Sounds good.